You're listening to Life Repurposed with Michelle Rayburn, where you'll find uplifting and practical advice for everyday living, creative inspiration for do-it-yourself projects, and recommendations for books and resources that will encourage you to embrace your life repurposed. I'm your host, Michelle Rayburn. Welcome to episode 11 of Life Repurposed. Thank you so much for joining me. If you are somebody who's been tuning in since the very beginning, or if this is your very first podcast or video blog that you're tuning in on, I am so glad to have you here joining me. So if you want to get more of the info than I'm giving on camera or giving on the recording, you can find show notes, which is basically an article that accompanies this episode, and that is at michellerayburn.com slash 11. So you'll find that on my website. So this episode is titled, Stop Apologizing, The Truth About the Lies That Hold Us Back. I'm from the Midwest, and maybe you've heard the expression Midwest nice, and maybe you've encountered some people who apologize often if you've ever visited us in the Midwest. So here's an example. I'm in the Target store, and I'm shopping, and I bump into somebody or somebody brushes up against me and the immediate response that somebody gives is, sorry, or, oh, excuse me, or actually the word that we really do use is, oh, and you'll see some social media memes about that, but we do say, oh, sorry, and I've actually caught myself saying that often, so you can tell that I grew up in the Midwest. So uh, we sometimes think people do this to be super nice, and We've even thought that maybe they're the really humble people, but I'm wondering if there's more behind our habits of apologizing, and I know it's not just a Midwest thing. It's maybe a little more public in the Midwest, but I'll give you some examples in a minute where I think you might identify that you've apologized for some things. So this is really where we're apologizing for something that's either out of our control or it's simply silly or it is... um, something that isn't our responsibility at all, and yet we're saying, I'm sorry for this. And it's different than the compassion we have when someone loses a loved one and we say, I'm sorry for your loss. It isn't that kind of thing. So here are some examples of ways that we apologize. And I even do this if I accidentally cut someone off in traffic. (laughs) I turned one day at a stoplight and it was not my turn. And I realized that after I started turning and somebody honked at me and I felt really bad about it. And then I'm trying to like mouth enunciate, sorry, and even waving. And I think sometimes they think you're giving them a different gesture, but I'm just shaking my head and waving my hands and saying, I'm so sorry. But here's some other ways that we do it. Uh, Someone comes over to our house and we say, please excuse the mess. And maybe our house isn't even that dirty or by um, that person's standards it might be, but by my own it's not, but I'm apologizing for my house. Or I run into somebody at the store that I, you know, it's like when you get dressed up, no, you don't see anyone and then you go out in your sweats to just pick up one quick thing and you run into people you know. It is so true that that happens. And so our first response might be, oh, sorry, I look a mess. I didn't do my hair today. I didn't put on makeup today before I left the house. Uh, Another one, I hate to bother you, but... Or you have a conversation with a really good friend and suddenly you stop and you say, I'm sorry for talking so much. Maybe you really had a need and you just needed to talk it out. Another one, we walk up to the librarian at the library at the desk, or we see someone on the street and we need directions, and we say, sorry, could I ask you a question? And by the way, that was a question, so you already asked one. But we apologize before we even ask for something sometimes. Another one, um, you know, like we're looking for directions. Sorry, is this the way to the conference room? Or somebody compliments us on what we're wearing, And um, this is also common in the Midwest for people to say, oh, I got that on sale. Or, oh, this ratty thing, I've had this forever. Um, The other day I was out and about and somebody gave me a compliment and I immediately thought of a response that was sort of like, "Eh." and then we have to stop and think, oh, thank you. That's all I need to say is thank you. Uh, Maybe you apologize when you set boundaries and you say no. 
So so somebody has asked you to do something and you know you can't do it. And your first response is, sorry, I can't do that right now. And I know it sounds like we're trying to be nice, but are we really letting somebody move in on our boundaries and acting as if we have a reason for why we should be sorry for why we can't do that thing rather than saying, I'm sorry, Oh, I did it. Oh my goodness. I did it myself. See, I can't even give you an example without accidentally doing it. Oh, good example. Okay. So instead of saying, I'm sorry, I can't do that. Let's think of a better, a better way. Um, an example would be somebody asks me if I can serve on a committee or a team. And I say, that does not fit with my priorities. Okay, end of story. I don't have to give a reason because that's giving an apology. So if I say even that doesn't fit with my priorities right now, that gives them a window of hope of thinking, oh, I could ask her again. Or um, if I say I wish I could help out, but I can't, again, that's kind of an apology. So these are some ways that we apologize. And I've seen articles that call this sorry syndrome. And some studies have actually shown that some of this type of apologizing can make us likable people. So I'm not saying it's all bad, but I'm asking us to look at, is there a sense of false humility that's coming in? Are we using this because we want to appear humble or is there a genuineness there or is it just the way we go? Like, do we go to being a victim right away? I think that's more often the case is that there's something in our upbringing or something in our confidence level that makes us think we need to apologize for who we are. So I'm asking you, are you an apologizer? Are you someone who catches yourself doing it? I do it. My husband definitely does it way more than I do. I am probably the bossier of the two of us. And so I'm more likely to give a direct order, but I still catch myself doing it. Um, Sometimes it's when I am asked to give an opinion about something and I want to give an honest opinion and I don't love the thing that someone is showing me. And so my response is, I'm sorry, I just don't love it. And really, do I have to apologize for my honest opinion when someone asks for it? Can I deliver it in a gentle way where I say, I don't love it, and I know that's disappointing for you, but I don't love it. Can we do it that way? Can we acknowledge the other person's feeling about our opinion, but can we not apologize for having our opinion? Okay, so are you an apologizer? Have you noticed that you apologize about everything? Um, There are other ways that we might go into it that doesn't sound like quite an apology, like we're not saying I'm sorry, but I've seen the term um, hedging, where it's like a precursor to apology or an apologetic language. So so things like, excuse me, can I ask? Or I might be wrong, but, and then you share your opinion. Or you say, I don't know, but... So you're, you're sounding as if you can doubt yourself and doubt your own opinions and your thoughts. So that's sort of like having an apology. So I want to ask you if you've ever felt this way and get a little bit honest and raw with your thoughts right now. I want you to ask yourself if you've ever felt this. I'm a bother to people and I shouldn't get in their way. That's a really good sign that you are an apologizer. Um, another one, my house is way messier than everyone else's. Why would anyone ever want to come over here? Again, you're apologizing before you even give somebody a chance to want to have a place in your life. Um, another one, I am taking up too much space in this seat on the airplane. I have not lost the 50 pounds that I wanted to by now, and I know that I'm making the person next to me uncomfortable. I've had this where I feel like I have to sit in an airplane, like I can't bump anyone because I am not in an ideal body weight. And ugh, actually on charts, even though I'm working on getting healthier, on the charts I would be considered morbidly obese. And so when I travel on an airplane, I feel bad. Like they're going to see me come. And this is all within me. I know you can send me letters if you want. I'm, I'm projecting my actual feelings out there. But I get on the plane and I wonder... Are those people who are already seated looking at me going, oh, is she going to have to sit in the middle seat between us? So um, these are these are ways we apologize without even verbalizing it. Another one, have you had this thought? I really don't deserve this. It should go to someone else. 
maybe it's a promotion or an award or a free gift card or you won something, whatever it is. I have seen so many people who turn it down, even though they really deeply inside want it, they turn it down because they just don't think they deserve it. That would be an apologizer. So let me tell you the truth about your identity. There is no need for you to apologize for anything unless you have done something to actually offend somebody, then yes, you do need to say I'm sorry. And, you know, we learned that back when we were kids, when mom said, say you're sorry. Okay, we understand that kind of apology. But I want you to understand your identity and who you are as a human being and how you do not need to apologize for being here. You don't need to apologize for breathing. You don't need to apologize for the weather. You don't need to apologize for your dirty floors or for getting the promotion that someone else really wanted, but you are just as qualified and you earned it. So here are three things about your identity that I want to leave with you before we move on to our next segment of this episode. Your identity is this. You are loved. You are loved by God You have maybe not discovered it yet, but you are loved. And it's my deepest desire that you would discover how much God loves you, even if the people who you've met in your life have not been loving to you. Number two, you are not a mistake. God created you with a unique uh, purpose and a unique personality, flaws and all. It is all part of who you are. And you don't discover this value by digging down deep somewhere inside of you and pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and finding value. It was put in you from the moment you were born, and it is because you are made in the image of God that you have this value and you are not a mistake. And so it's not finding it within you at all unless you're finding it within you because you are searching for God and you um, have him at the heart of your life and then he's within you and then. But it's not like I have to look for some mysterious power that was missing when I was created. You were, I'm just telling you, you, me, none of us were made as a mistake. And number three, you are not less than. You are not less than. You are not less than someone else. You are not less than the image of perfection. Yes, of course, we're not perfect people and we mess up and all kinds of things happen in life. But you are not less than valuable just because you have some flaws and mistakes. So my encouragement for you is to stop apologizing and live in the truth of who God created you to be, imperfections and all. So for our practical session, our our second part of the um, podcast and video blog, I've brought a prop. I like to do that sometimes. So I've brought this old suitcase. I love to collect old trunks. This one I have painted and I often use it when I go speaking as a prop. And if you are listening on the podcast, you can't see it, but you can always check in on YouTube and see it. And I'm going to set it down in a minute, but I'm holding on to it for a second to ask you a question of what would life be like if you had to carry this thing around with you everywhere you went. And actually, just by itself with nothing in it, it feels heavy enough to me. And then if I started to pack some stuff in it, it would be pretty awkward to take with me. And um, I use this as a, a an illustration, as an object lesson when I talk to groups, because I feel like A lot of us are carrying around a trunk like that full of emotional baggage and we take it everywhere. So it goes with us when we go shopping and it goes with us when we go to church and it goes to work with us and it goes to our social things with us and we carry it around. And um, so some of you are thinking, oh yes, I already have something like that. It's called my toddler. (laughs) Yes, I know what it was like to have to carry my two little boys around with me everywhere I went. And now I want you to imagine you're carrying a toddler and you're carrying a bag of groceries and that big giant purse that you have to carry to have everybody's junk in it. And then you have to carry this trunk full of stuff. And imagine if I said, well, you can't really set that trunk down because it's part of your identity right now. And so you have to have it with you and you have to take it in the bathroom with you. You have to take it everywhere. It's annoying after a while. Is that annoying? I ask my husband that all the time. So yes, it's annoying to have to carry around baggage. So um, 
The reason I use that as an illustration is that I think there are a lot of people who are carrying around baggage that they've packed away and it becomes almost like an apology because you're incapacitated. You can't do the things that you're really called to do because one hand is always bound. And I'm saying this figuratively, but one hand is always bound to that baggage. And until we set it down and we let it go, we don't move forward. And so we're always saying, oh, I'd love to help, but uh, sorry, we're doing that apology. And a lot of it is because we're lacking the confidence or we're thinking we are less than and I have nothing to offer. And actually, if I'm wound up in protecting my baggage, I really don't have a lot to offer. So I would really like to encourage you to think about how could I set down the baggage and start to move forward. There is a verse that I want to read you from Psalm 139 verse 14 that is such a good reminder for us. It says, thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. And here, this is a psalm written to God in appreciation and just saying, thank you for making me wonderfully complex, emotions and all, and responses and all. So if your baggage has crowded out your ability to receive love and to receive grace and, and to receive compliments or anything like that from others, I want you to ask yourself, what would my first step be? in setting down the baggage and moving forward. What do I need to let go of it? And in the upcoming resources section, I'm going to give a resource to you of an example of how we can start that process if you don't really know where to begin. So that's coming up if you uh, just hang in there for a minute. I have one other thing here to share with you because if you are following me on Instagram, I mentioned that I hid an Easter egg in this episode and you had to listen to find out what it was. And you're if you're watching or listening right now, you don't even know what I'm talking about. You will have to go to Instagram and find the post where I explain that. But the secret phrase you need to know is break free. So the secret phrase is break free. And if you go to Instagram, you'll find out what that's all about and what you're supposed to do with it. Stay tuned because we're having a resource next. As I promised, I am going to share a resource with you. And this time I want to share a book that is written by a writer friend of mine who I would consider a dear friend, even though I don't see her all that often or get to talk to her very much, but she has played a significant role in my life as a writer and as a speaker from way back when she directed a conference that I had an opportunity to be part of. So I wanna share with you this book, a little tiny book called The Power to Be, and it's written by Twyla Belk. And I'm going to have the info on the website at michellerayburn.com slash 11. So you'll be able to go there and actually find a link so you can get this little book if you want to. But this is a little 40-day devotional and it it has it covers four different topics. Be still, be grateful, be strong, and be courageous. And one of the things that I love whenever I'm stuck in just living in a lie or, or listening to lies that aren't true about myself is to learn what God's word says about me and apply that. And this is what this little devotional does. And so um, Twyla has all kinds of little stories from her own life. And then she gives this little power statement, which is really cool because it's like an I statement of a truth I'm claiming from this devotional. And then a reflection and a response place where you can ask some questions, reflect, maybe even even do some journaling based on that. And I feel like the topics that this little 40 day devotional walks through are a really good place to start if you want to gradually start to release some of the things that hold you back. Um, I wanted to read an excerpt, but I won't take the time to, to do a whole one here. But that Psalm that I mentioned, Psalm 139 verse 14, uh, Twyla has a devotional based on that and it's called See Yourself as God Sees You and I encourage you um, to look at that. And then the um, power statement from that is, I am strong, I know who I am, and I realize my value comes from God. So that's an example. 
So there's one other little thing I want to tell you about devotions is that I've seen some books out there that are called devotionals, and I think it's really important to know what you're getting when you're getting a book. Twyla grounds everything in scripture. In fact, there's a verse at the beginning of every devotional, and then all of the content she has within these short little readings is also based on scripture. She has other verses mentioned in here. There are some books out there that call themselves devotionals that have no scripture in them at all. They're just positivity kind of things. And I say that because I want you to steer yourself towards devotionals that are grounded in scripture, grounded in the word of God, in the Bible, because those are the things that are going to change your life. We could get positivity statements by just going on Instagram and, and seeing all the little memes that people put up with that. Um, but it's so important to get the word of God. So that's my little Announce, uh, service announcement for you if you're going shopping for devotionals is to look for one that actually has some Bible verses in there. So that is all for this week. I want you to remember to go to Instagram and check out what I'm talking about with that post that I mentioned. Um, also, when you send me a direct message on Twitter or Facebook, on Instagram, I love it if you tell me something about the bio that I have on there um, that you resonate with. Like, I like to reach out to when I see it says um, mom of boys. I love to reach out to other moms who have boys and just say, hey, I'm a boy mom too. Or other podcasters. Um other empty nesters. So just take a look at my bio and see if there's something where you're like, yeah, I can connect with her on that. And just send a direct message saying hello. And um, I feel like we're kindred sisters or something like that. So I love to get that kind of mail and messaging. Um, if you want to get a notification like an email every time an episode comes out, you can sign up at michellerayburn.com and you'll just get an email in your inbox that says the latest issue is posted and it'll tell you what the topic is. Or you could sign up, um, you could actually subscribe on, on um, iTunes or on Google Play. And then once you subscribe to a podcast, you get it on your podcast list as soon as the new episodes come out. So um, check that out. Show notes are at michellerayburn.com slash 11. And I'm looking forward to seeing you again in a couple weeks. You've been listening to Life Repurposed with Michelle Rayburn. Check out tips, resources, and inspiration at michellerayburn.com.